Hello everyone, welcome to the Melting Pot Podcast. I'm your host, Dominic Monkhouse. The Melting Pot is as a result of my hunger for optimizing business performance, scaling up organizations, corporate culture, customer addiction, building high-performing teams, along with a few other obsessions along the way. I've spent the last several years working for and with some of the most successful top performing companies in the world. And this podcast is my attempt to synthesize what I've learned along the way to help you build a high quality business and live a more fulfilling life. If you enjoy the podcast, you can find more information on today's episode and other topics at dominicmonkhouse.com. Today I'm chatting to Spencer Gallagher and Pete Hull of Cactus. They were the founder, CEO and CFO respectively of a digital agency, Blue Halo, that they scaled up and sold. And what they've been doing after that is running their business called Cactus, which is a consultancy that specializes in helping digital agency owners get on that tricky point of the curve from sort of half a million, 750 past a million, million and a half, and and on their way to three to five million. And they've both recently co-authored a book called Agency Nomics, which we'll talk about, and some fascinating things that they've, data that they've captured along the way. The impact on employee net promoter score from organizational structure, and also some of the things that they found out around marketing and the lead flow, 30, 30, 10, is one of the things that Spencer will share with us. A wide-ranging and uh, fascinating discussion, I thought. So I hope you enjoy it. Cheers. So I'm Spencer Gallagher. My life started uh, with an agency in 1999, which I built through to 2008. Um, sold it to a big ad agency and then um, called Gyro. And now they're part of the Dead 2 Network. And then in 2011, my former FDP, we started Cactus uh, as joint partners. And we are today the leading consultancy helping uh, agency scale more recently Pete you better say this bit otherwise I'll do all the talking more recently we wrote a book we've written a book <laughs> <laughs> and who are you uh, Pete Hall um, I'm Spencer's business partner worked with him since the Blue Halo days back in 2004 all the way through to now uh, my area of specialism is uh, CFO for agencies kind of from the 1 million size to 5 million size in terms of helping them structure their finances for growth etc around those kind of metrics Fabi and Cactus how, how long has that been going Eight years now, isn't it? 2011, 12, I yeah, think you started. Years. Eight years. And yeah. You've got some fab stats because I think you sent you sent out a New Year's email, which was sort of, we've helped this many people grow this many agencies. Can yeah. you get any of those stats off the top of your head? Apart from the ones we made well, up. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, um, we, we, I think it was actually last year we, we stopped and we wrote down all of the clients we'd helped. Um, it was about 85 clients over the past eight years. And I say 85 more of the sort of full-time clients. We've actually helped over a thousand agencies in some shape or form over the past eight years. But from the 80, 80, I think it was 80, 85, we had a spreadsheet and we worked out the average growth had been just over 85%, weirdly enough, per annum, wow. which was pretty outstanding. And, I, you know, I guess there's... Uh, some element of there's some smaller agencies in there that have had massive rapid growth, several hundred percent. But uh, and then obviously as they get much bigger, they sort of start slowing down. But as an average, and and actually, you know, several of those clients have uh, been you know very capable of sort of qualifying for Deloitte Tech Fast Fifty and European Fast Five Hundred type league tables and stuff. So, what size agency do you typically work with? And typically, they're around um, seven fifty to a million in fees and upwards. Uh-huh. Um, most of them are looking to grow in some way, shape, or form to get to you know three, four, five million with a decent EBIT. So that you know, we used to say, well, they're going to grow and sell, but it's more around having choices these days. You know, they get to that level and they can say, well, we can take the agency on further, do some acquisitions, sell, or some of them are just enjoying it and going to keep growing. Yes, the sadistic when, ones. At, well, at <laughs> seven hundred and fifty thousand, so by the time they get to four million, either the sadistic or those pains, you've helped them get get rid of those pains. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, and I think when you get to a million e bit and above from an agency perspective, there's lots more advisors involved, and maybe they've raised more money, they've got more private equity, or they may have big group. Uh, but agencies are often owned by groups, and for us, I think Pete and I, we we kind of like to have much more. You know, we had to work with the owner entrepreneurs or the 
the shareholding uh, shareholders and I think you know who are more autonomous yeah. who we can go in we can show them uh, what we've learned over the, the past how many years almost 20 years I guess working in that in agency world and um, I think we have more influence around that I always sort of say you know, I, you know, yeah, uh, there's more immediate effects from, from our advice, isn't it? Yeah, seven fifty turn over. They can make a decision, then they can go and act on it straight away, and you know, and then we can come back the next month, and there's more things to do. But if we worked for, I don't know, the subsidiary of a, a group company who owned an agency, it would go up the chain of command, and perhaps our advice wouldn't have the same effects, which isn't as motivating to us. Yeah, and did, how much of what you now know did you know selling Blue Halo, and how much have you learned? Oh, great question. Um, Here's a great question. <laughs> in well, delivering for the 85 clients you've helped. Well, I'm not known for exaggeration, but I'd probably I say... <laughs> <laughs> I, 10 times as much. As yeah, I mean, I wrote on my LinkedIn profile, I think 75% more, I think. But it, I mean, it could be more than that. I was a bit naive. I thought that after, building, after we built and sold Blue Halo, that we kind of knew everything. But you can't, even today we learn new things yeah. every single right. day. So I think the truth is it probably is more like 95%. Because the world's moving and business is moving and we're seeing things every day. I mean, I'm intrigued that that learning then, is that you're having to help a client solve a problem or are they teaching you something that you didn't know? A bit of both, I think. Okay. Yeah, for me it's um, probably more having to work through the problems with the clients. And when you've... From my perspective, I came straight out of practice into Blue Halo. So I worked with one agency for four or five years. I then worked with the group business for another two years or so and saw four or five more agencies. If you think of all the different agencies I've been in, different size, structures, working on different types, you know, different spaces with different sectors, um, it's kind of applying all the knowledge that I've got, but with different people. And there's often different outcomes, which provides learning all the time. And for example, um, we can go into an agency. A lot of the time, agencies want us to come in to help validate what they're doing right as much as what they're doing wrong. Yeah. And by validating what they're doing well and benchmarking what they do well, sometimes we're like, wow, you're actually doing something better than anyone we've come across. How are you doing that? And then we do learn that way. But of course, hopefully the things that we're then bringing is the things that they're not doing so well. And we're able to share those and also share what best in class looks like. It's not anti-competitive either because often it's not, you know, it's not something directly that's unique to anyone. It's just a, a subtlety in their an idiosyncrasy in the way that they're approaching a particular problem. Yeah, well, it's, it's just, it, you bring it in that external benchmark, aren't you? So, you know, somebody runs a meeting well and you just say look you run really great meetings or somebody runs a meeting poorly and you you guys could probably be 40% more productive if, if you just fix that even if not even if nothing else got changed yeah, yeah. definitely there's no question every day we walk away I just you know wow that's amazing there's something comes out of the business the data the pressure in fact the recent one for me really actually was been working his business a long time now, but the, we got asked to go to America last year to go and help a client. We travelled over to Boise, Idaho, and the branding, the agency's approach to branding was just simply better than any other agency we've been into. And we kind of realised that sort of software style or tech startups are really good at telling their story because they're always trying to raise money, they're pivoting. They've always got great stories, but actually agencies who think would have great stories because often there's creativity or brand at the heart of what they do, often are quite poor at their storytelling. And we went to Boise and we saw, didn't we, it was a great agency and, and, and actually came back really and sort of said to a lot of the UK agencies, we were, look, we've just got to work better on your brand story. You know, yeah. there's, and then recently we, we got a client in Scotland called May Brave and brought us in and was like, after eight years in this job, finally walked in an agency thought, wow, these guys just do their agency branding, not only their client's brand, but their own branding. Just a great story as well. Great, you know, and, and actually it's already now set a benchmark for What's everybody their, else to... story? As in me tell their story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you should get him on, actually, because he's... He, I mean, they've got this great video. They just filled their whole office up with those little plastic balls and yeah. their meeting room. Um, the, the story... What's he, what's he called? I'll get him on. Uh, it's Andrew Dobby. And okay. they... Um, I'll get you I'll get, oh, Yeah, the, the sort of... The quick story was, you know, had a child and just decided that he didn't want to necessarily work for somebody else and wanted to see his son grow up. He had, like, a, you know, a few hundred quid in the bank and literally in a small box went and set an agency up 
And um, I think the whole premise was, you know, why would someone pay £3.99 for a cup of coffee when it should only cost 99p? Well, they do that because there's a green logo on it and that's the value of brands. Yeah. So I'm going to, and that was his basic story. I hope I told it well, Andrew. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, but it's more than that, much more than that, because he lives, and they live and breathe every single touch point in their business. I mean, the thing I love the most is you go in the office they, they obviously know that their target audience is sort of 35 to 45 year olds. So what you've got is um, every toy that you had as a child. So when you walk in there, there's something like there was a Batman car, the fires matched it out the back. I remember that I was nine years old. <laughs> and so there's, you go in and there's an emotional connection to the business because you're like, oh, I had that car when I was younger. And all of a sudden you get, you know, that anchoring back to that memory yeah. of being, you know, where we're young and happy and old and miserable. No, I'm joking. Um, but it's little things like that, tiny little things they do very, very How well. They've been going now seven or eight years and they haven't lost that story. It's still part of their, their DNA. And they still, still tell that story. I think the point Spencer's making is that sometimes when we go into our clients, they had that in the beginning and then it gets lost. And then, you know, they're kind of searching for their, their purpose or their why and it's, why did we set this agency up? And they all know and can tell the story, but there's nothing out there to connect the clients with them emotionally to how, how why they started their, their or agency new, or why they're doing it. Or new prospective employees. Well, yeah. You know, just that. Here's That's a, even more important in some cases. Yeah, here's a business with a purpose. Yeah. Somebody wanted to change something, do something. If they set the business up for that purpose, does that flow through into their work-life balance ethos? If they think work-life balance is important, I guess, to their particular purpose. I mean, I, I think there's some businesses, aren't there, where the culture's like yeah. everyone's there and is something that's very important to have the work-life balance. I think most agencies, on the whole, I would say are much more progressive with culture than other types of businesses. I mean, most brands and organisations, when they have an agency, they kind of almost go, I'd like to work in here. Because they were the you know one of the first people to have you know, the beanbags and the tennis, you know, to make the workplaces, you know, with the tech businesses, by the way, I mean, tech and agencies, I say, are right at the forefront of this. They, they have flexible working before probably a lot of large organisations put it in. They, as you, you've had from your own podcast, they have unlimited holiday. They have all of those kinds of benefits. Well, I saw unlimited holiday today. Uh, Elvis agency has just brought in. So they, they tend to bring a lot of the new working practices earlier than, let's say, the general marketplace. So I think agencies are quite good when it comes to, although, and it's quite this is quite a uh, contentious subject, I think the biggest stress that probably comes into agencies is actually the client demands. You know, the demands of the clients can be quite, because they're using an agency as an outsourced provider yeah. to solve a problem, you know, or uh, that they don't have the expertise or resource to do. So what happens is they sometimes can sort of, you know, put a lot of pressure on their agencies, which is hard for the team to manage. But yeah, I think cultures and agencies are pretty progressive. Flat structures, pod systems, they're all there. So the pod system segues me into the book because that's one of the things, the points you make in the book about structure yeah. is important. So uh, should we dive into that? Or yeah, let's do it. Back and it's a specialist out? subject to yours as well, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe we'll wind, keep, hold the pod thing. Why, why the book? What? Why How long book? did it take you to write this oh, book? Um, probably about the same time as it took to paint the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> like, this is what it feels like. I don't know. I think for Spencer and I's perspective, when we first set our business up, we had probably a bit more free time than we have now, to be fair. You know, it's the early days. We're probably just starting out. And we thought we had some great stories to share. So um, we hired... Um, this girl, I can't remember her name, I feel bad now. Bryony. Bryony, yeah. of course. And she would call us, you know, once or twice a week and we'd sit there and download stories to her and little tips and tricks. We started putting this Google Doc together. And as we got bigger, we kind of forgot about it really. And then um, maybe it was about two years ago now. South by Southwest, there was a lady speaking on stage. You That's right, yeah. Literally, it was two years ago this week. And we were like, we've got a book somewhere. You sort of if search you, the archives. You're like, oh, there is a book in, in Google And she Docs. said on stage, though, she said the only way to finish a book is to go to, remember, go to a hotel, yeah. tell your husband or wife not to call you unless someone's died, and just go to it and lock yourself away. So we came up with a plan to do we that. We we were going to finish the book. We're gonna, it was yeah. Finished. Open the document and thought, actually, this is a good, a solid six out of seven start out of ten for a book that we didn't we'd forgotten we had mm -hmm. um, yeah, so true. we then spent the next year or so I would say it was probably around last 
April time, it was really coming together. We went and spent our romantic weekend in Bournemouth together. We did, yeah. For three months. <laughs> that was uh, an experience. As in, it was hard writing the book. <laughs> Just to, yeah. clear, to clear that up. Um, and then it you was... Travel Bournemouth. Bournemouth. Yeah. Um, and then it was... Um, evenings, weekends, dealing with copywriters, etc., getting it to the point where finally in September we could release it to the outside world. Yeah, it's been... It's, we thought we'd only sell 130 copies, yeah. right? That was because the, there were only 16 and a half, roughly, thousand agencies in the UK. So we always had it in our head that, you know, you get sort of 2% market share, somewhere like that. It's such a niche business book, right, to help an agency grow from startup or zero up to the first three to five million. It is incredible how many we've sold. I mean, yeah, it, we're quite, still quite surprised. We've got to number one yeah. in the Amazon, you know, uh, charts for advertising and uh, also the, for marketing as well. So, and now we, so 20% of book sales are coming from the rest of the world, mainly uh-huh. America, and that's just amazing. So, and what's it called? It's called Agency Nomics. In fact, really, I should credit Pete because I forgot to say I was also a head of brand. <laughs> <laughs> Pete came up with a name, which is genius. Yeah. And we're going- uh, it was basically um, the little phrase I used. When I used to go networking, I used to talk to agency owners and they'd always tell me that they were doing 400000 a month. Um, but what they were doing was taking their best month ever, adding VAT and times in by 12. And rather than calling bullshit on it, I would say, well, it's agency nomics. It was a little phrase I had yeah. to, to whisper to Spencer. I heard another agency nomics uh, story. You know how people always talk about their business like they're a year ahead of work? Well, some people do. Three years ahead. <laughs> Three years ahead, yeah. And I think I think actually it can be quite damaging. And, and Pete and I realised that someone once came back to me and said, oh, you know, well, it's just not fair because agency X is making 30% and we should be too. And I was like... I know they're not. I went in, they did it one month, right? That's not a 12 yeah. months of 30%. There's so two reasons, really. One, to set the, rec- kind of the record straight and put something down about agency KPIs and the real yeah. truth. And secondly, actually, we quite like the name Agency Nomics, really. So we, we trademarked it a couple of years ago, um, kept that safe somewhere in the, in the drawer. Yeah. And actually, when we came to thinking of a working title for the book, it was just like, say economics that's just what it is yeah we called it spaghetti do you remember originally we did originally yeah yeah in 2011 12 yeah yeah because we were like unraveling the spaghetti of of agencies and yeah. how they run you know many people wearing many hats and it's a bit yeah. of a mess what are the themes for the book then I think there's, there's sort of four cornerstones, you know, in, in business, but, you know, especially in agencies. There's, if we go to an agency, there's always one of four problems. It's either the sales and marketing, the finance and the cash, it's the HR and the talent, or it's the process and delivery. So we kind of mapped out really our chapters around those four areas. Yeah. And um, I think we shared everything that we thought when we go into an agency that dispel some of the myths and share some of the, the practices that people and the approaches and the mindset you need to grow an agency. For example, you know, a lot of agencies don't really know I think they, where they think new business comes from isn't actually where it comes from. So we kind of dispel that myth and share our methodology from everything we've learned around how business actually comes into agencies. How does it really come in? And how do they think? What's the... When um, Blue Halo got sold, the CEO of the company that bought us said, once the, uh, the deal is all sort of public, come up to our offices, we'll get a glass of champagne, and I- I'll share with you the secret of agency new business. Now, having grown this agency for nine years and doing marketing and, and you know, doing quite a good job, right? we grew 1,100% uh, over a five-year period. We were a Deloitte Tech Fast 50, a European Fast 500 business. But I was like, there's a secret? You know, wow, like no one told me there was a secret. So when I met him and he started to show me all his sales process, and I was like, no, 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 no. Who's your biggest client? And he said, well, it's, it's Brand X. And it was you know, a very well-known brand. I said, I don't know how much they spent with you last year. And he said, 8 million in fees. And I said, well, how did you win that client? He said, uh, she's my next door neighbor. Oh, well, he's your second biggest client. And it was another major well-known Japanese brand and uh, how did you win that client so how much did they spend with you last year 5 million in fees so he's, he's the best mate in my triathlon club he's your third biggest client that was another well known airline and how much did they spend with you last year 3.5 million how did you win that client oh with the person in the marketing team's best mates with the person in our business development team 
and so on. He said, well, I went through the top 10 clients. And what I realized was it was nothing to do with the sales process. Actually, there was a huge amount to do with the personal relationships and the networks of the people in the business. Now, that made me think a bit deeper about that and wondered how pervasive that was. In We both sort of went back and started to kind of compile a big spreadsheet of all of the ages we met. So every time we meet someone now, we always go, who are your top 10 clients and where has the business come from? And we went through a billion pounds worth of pipeline. Uh, you know, we, we're very lucky. We work at 50 million pounds worth of agencies now anyway. So we, you know, we are seeing, we're seeing 150 million pounds worth of, of deals every year throughout our agency. So, you know, we're constantly monitoring this. And what we found was that there were four key areas that, that new business leads were generated from. And what was happening was 90% of agencies were spending pretty much 100% of their time focused on the area that was only bringing in about 10% of the leads. So, so here's the example. So, um, the second client we went into, do you remember the guys in Chester? Yep. We walked into the room. They gave us a tour and they walked, they, they opened this door up and there was a, a lady and they said, this is, this is Debbie from marketing. I was like, oh, hi Debbie, what are you doing? She had a whiteboard in front of her and she had, and it had Habitat, had like, uh, uh, like top shop, top man, all these retailers written on the wall. I said, what are you doing, Debbie? She goes, I'm, I'm ringing them up. And, I'm, and I'm, we, we, you know, we work with uh, Nex and Laura Ashley. So we're ringing them up. And I'm, I'm you know, telling them we're really good at retail. And we should work with them. And I said, how long have you been doing that for? She goes, six months. So how much have you won? She goes, nothing. <laughs> and I said, well, you won't win anything either. Because you won Nex and Laura Ashley because of the networking that the CEO did. And I'm not saying you never win a deal right from doing a cold call because I've got we've got stories. There's always examples. Some will say, "Oh well, I won a hundred grand deal doing it." But it, the point was, is there's no mix. There was no mix. It's like you know they get they get cool marketing businesses eight years ago on the whole, you know, to go out and try and find new business. But when you're selling a service, people are buying your chemistry and trust and capability. It's not a product sale as much as maybe it is in other spaces where there is a product element, there's a technology element, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we just started to perfect this methodology. On the whole, what we're saying to people is, you know, create a multi-pronged attack on your marketing. And um, But by sharing where people get business from, it stops people spending a lot of time and money spending it on areas where they're not getting business from. Yeah, spending on where they think the competition is winning. And yeah. because they just don't know. And they haven't done their own and their own analysis. They don't know what they don't know. Yeah. They don't know what they don't know, yeah. So, so how can you but how could you get more if it's from the CEO? So what you're saying is you get the CEO wins through networking. Don't well, spend it on Betty in the back room getting on the phone and the CEO's got to go out and do some more networking. I mean that's I guess where it starts in the early stages of, of an agency. Of course, um, once our agencies have set up um, a better marketing mix of, you know, of activity they're able to get more brands to come to them meet what more help the team build better networks because you know in the early days the CEO is probably the only person who out of the business but actually as the business grows you've got many more people who can do that so for example a lot of agencies and we've got one client has got six or seven people who speak in that business at events and they've all you know come across with because it's only really the the owners carry a certain amount of passion evangelistic you know they I call it manifest trust they build yeah. trust through their authority and that authority actually in today's world you know where people can build their personal brands and their influence anyone on the team can do that that's actually really helping to augment so some business now say six seven speakers in the business who are authorities on areas and that's building trust in chemistry and therefore more leads and, but I don't think you're I mean the thing that struck me about reading the book which is why I wanted to get you on the podcast is I don't think the things that you say are actually just applicable to agencies. Now, obviously, they might be more applicable to agencies and the stories you tell in the book are agency-specific. But I see that all the time more broadly where clients don't know how they've... They've just never sat and thought about it. Yeah. Um, you know, MDs who really have won all the business and then want to hire a salesperson yeah. and sort of retire from selling, and that's just going to be a yeah. disaster. Um, I mean, that, that CEO of that £100 million business, I mean, I, I remember reading not long ago actually about the guy from GE Money, but he spent all his time still dealing with sales, even though he was running GE Global. Not GE Money, it was actually GE um, General Electric globally. But the CEO of the HC that bought us, 
he was pretty much still in every, I mean, he rocked up for every pitch. I mean, he didn't necessarily do the presentation like probably he did when he was smaller because he had a team of people to do that. But his presence was still there because he needs to show the customer or the potential customer that, look, hey, you're an interesting, you know, you're important. Um, Which goes to show how important that is, really. I mean, what size business was that? 50 million? Turning? Yeah, 50 yeah, to 100 million. Yeah, at that point, 50 million. And, you know, he look, he wouldn't come into probably every single small pitch, but anything of significance, he's going to be there to show the importance. You're right. We find a lot of people recruit salespeople and agencies, expect them to do all the selling, but not really realizing as a sales professional, they're much better in a given a lead than if they are having to go out and find them. Again, not saying there aren't people out there who do that very well, but if the marketing person in the agency and the owner can really augment some lead generation and then pass it through uh, to the salesperson to help manage that process to ask those difficult questions, it does help. And you've got sort of a magic ratio, haven't you, for that? We call it the 30, 30, 30, 10, you know, because what we identify was the 30% of business was coming from what we call NES, which is networking, speaking, thought leadership and events. We identified the 30% was coming from strategic partnerships, which is actually probably one of the areas that agencies are either really good at or just don't have a clue. And then the next one, which is the most common area, which is client referring you to another client or a client leaving and going to it. So a marketing director leaves, goes to another brand because they work with you before and they trust you and they know you you know your stuff they bring them with them mm-hmm. again it's a service business not a product so you kind of need to know that your agency's got your back they're gonna make you look good in your job and then the last 10 percent area comes from what we call outbound so it, it's look every lead in your agency should be inbound from all four areas but we call it outbound or the 10 percent area mainly because a lot of the activity was very much the push side so it was the cold call it was maybe things like pr uh, maybe it was things like social media the truth is is that that area has probably grown a bit since you know trust is becoming more you know easier to to online now right? i mean like people will trust people because of their persona online because we look at the you know that if they're uh, some position of influence then it is building but nevertheless um it's still you know not more than probably 20 percent in the majority of agencies mm-hmm. so yeah so and when we go to agency i'd say they do two out of those four areas well yeah the agencies for example that are very good with clients leaving and taking them with them the client ref- or they get client referrals they tend to be the ones that grow the slowest yeah, uh, because they just rely on their clients to grow their They're business. Like inwardly focused than outwardly focused. Yeah, the conversion rates are much higher. And then um, the people that focus on the strategic partnerships and maybe the nest, the networking speed, they tend to grow faster. Uh-huh. And the ones that spend more area in the 10% area tend to have very low, because the 10% area typically converts about like 7 to 9%, because a lot of the inbound leads that are coming in from outbound activity, like even like search, they tend to convert a lot less. And we've got lots of data to back this up. And it, and it, and there's, there's some great leads come from that area, but it tends to be a lot more work. So there tends to be a lot more confusion in those agencies around um, the time they're spending to win and not to win yeah. deals. So that, that was kind of one thing. And then the other thing really was just getting, helping agencies just qualify better as well, because that was, you know, a lot of people going after leads that just, they had no chance of winning. Bidding for work that they're never going to win. And yeah. putting time, in the agency world, putting a lot of time and effort. Yeah. A lot of yeah. creative effort into a bid that they just can't win. Yeah. But qualifying is always... I think actually we have, because we, we know each other, right, because of Warhive. Yeah. Because we both sit on the board there. And it's funny, Kevin, who who looks after the agency partners, he always says to me how agencies just, you know, he's a professional sales guy. He's always saying, they just don't qualify stuff. And I'm like, I know, you know, it's like the, probably the first thing we teach everybody is, in fact, I think the pipeline soft, uh, system we use, people win about 50% of the deals they go for. Whereas when we go in and they're using some kind of CRM pipeline tool, they're winning like maybe 10% of what goes in there. So we get people working... Um, smarter mm. on less opportunities and pitch to win or you know if they're not having to pitch because other people then propose to win well, and then you can pull the CEO in because it's not so many and all of that stuff and then you just feel more energetic about yeah, the business the momentum like, gets yeah, well, yeah. the agency it's winning a few deals yeah like winning one in ten just makes you feel 
Well, it sucks. Oh, it just can't be asked. And then your quality goes down. And then, oof. so what you said that was one of the cornerstones. Then talk about cash because then that gets Pete the chance to get a word in. Exactly. <laughs> Cash. So yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, there's a few things that are covered in the book, and I suppose um, cash flow management being my area of, you know, specialist chosen subject. If I was a mastermind talking about agencies over the number of years, because actually most of them are they do struggle for cash flow. So when I'm going into agencies, it's the first thing I'm looking at. You know, do they have any bank facilities? Do they have the right level of bank facilities? Um, what are they doing with their their cash flow forecasting? How are they managing their debtors? What's their invoicing profile? So for me, that's been you know that's kind of the the, the area of key focus going in. What I found with most agencies is that and this probably applies to you know any service business really, but it's been something that stood out for me is that if you're making you know less than ten percent net profit and the debtors are taking more than forty five days to pay on average, then you never see the cash. So in that respect, it's going to be very hard to to grow or even sustain an agency without having some sort of tight cash flow management in place. And then moving on to then having the right people in place, which is one of the things I talk about in the book, and having the right person for the right size business. So you wouldn't go and recruit, a, I mean, it sounds obvious, right? It's not rocket science, but you wouldn't recruit a 100 grand a year FD when you're turning over 750K. It's not not necessarily the underground salary it's a problem. It's the fact that they will only be working half a day a week out of five because there'll be nothing to do in the business. <laughs> So it's just finding the right person, having the right structure as you grow, um, just getting the right things done, really. There's certain things in the business that you've got to have on time, you know, bank reconciled, so you know where that position is. You know, you, your account's done within two weeks of month end, so you can see where you are cash flow forecasting, looking out that way. It's one or two reports like that are quite key, really, and it doesn't take that long with the right level of resource to get that in, just to give you a bit more reassurance about where you really are. Yeah. And one of the big metrics in the book, Pete, as well, which is which does have an impact to cash flow rate, is the the kind of the wage Lost the wages. The yeah, yeah. Which is something that's I mean it's one one of the, the biggest uh, things that we focus on actually with our agencies. And I think we learned this a long time ago. I think it's perhaps something that we kind of found by accident running our business. We kind of had a really good I would say finger on the pulse as to yeah. where our level of resource needed to be. Um, but actually, when we were acquired, one of the things that the CFO took me aside and said, look, there's a, you know, there's a few metrics we like to focus on. And one of those things is wage cost to GP. Um, so as we've you know taken this into our consulting life now, it's one of the things that we focus on, you know, having that, uh, you know, the way, total wage cost of the business being no more than 63% of the, of the gross profits is a very, very good <laughs> indicator of whether you've got enough enough people in the business or whether you're spending too much money on people it's the biggest cost in the agency so you know being at 70 75 percent mark if you go away and you know crunch the numbers right now it's going to be very unlikely that you're making any profit uh, which is going to cause you know greater pressure on cash and you know stagnate any potential growth further and what's the secret sauce behind 63 the secret source. Well, I don't think it's or necessarily it just, it's secret just, source. It's just, just it looking at the, you know, it can vary huge, a bit as well, right? I mean, it can. Yeah. The swings, yeah. yeah, I mean, we kind of work with a number between high fifties to high sixties, right. depending on where the agency is in their growth cycle, where they are geographically. I mean, bizarrely, we acted for an agency in Liverpool, but where Liverpool is geographically, it's out on a little peninsula, so it's, it's kind of isolated. The wage costs were actually quite high to attract people to come, you know, and stay in Liverpool and work rather than, you know, trying to attract people from Manchester where there are abundance of agencies. So they're kind of, you know, nuances to this, but broadly, you know, that's, it's come from learning from looking at 80, 90, 100 agencies over the last seven, eight years, really. And again, those numbers will be just as applicable to any other service business as, as an agency? Yeah, potentially. I think, um, you know, if you're an accounting business, for example, you've got a very similar model. You sell time, the day rates are reasonably similar. But what will happen is the, the staff rates will be lower because there's a load more accountants out there than there are, you know, brand specialists or strategy guys or designers or whatever. Right. Because there's still, a, I feel, a bit of a shortage in, in the industry in terms of decent people. So the, the, the kind of, the rates for a, a service-based business are kind of higher right. than they would be. Uh, for example, I know someone who's a qualified solicitor at the moment working for a top 20 firm earning £26,000 a year which is about the same as a you know a graphic designer who's been there about 18 months 
right now. So yeah. there's your comparison. Yes. Yeah. And actually, on the cash side of it, though, there's, the other thing we see a lot is we go and sometimes it's the opposite and there's loads of cash because maybe they've been worried about taking on facilities, they've been maybe protective over money and they store up reserves. And we do still find that quite common. And then they've yeah, always got another often, problem. Often the worst run businesses. Yeah, and often the highest risk businesses. Yeah. Which, yeah. Ironically, even they've got loads of cash to bank. Because they become, as they get more mature, they get quite complacent because they're like, well, we've got you know 750K in the bank, we're turning over 2 million quid. So we're, we're in a pretty safe place, but that means that things slip. So they get a bit more lax at chasing debts. They don't worry so much about getting contracts signed. They don't get stage payments signed off. And then before you know where you are, you're in a place where I go into one of these agencies and I'm saying, well, guys, out of your 400 grand of, of debt owed right now, 200 of it is over six months old. And then it's a really big problem. We had a case ourselves, didn't we, where our biggest yeah, cash client that. basically had the biggest bad debt last year because they took on the work, they had the cash, wasn't didn't redo the due diligence. And the commercials are, are quite lax, but if you go into a smaller agency where they're literally fighting for every penny, yeah. they will chase every debt down. They'll get every stage payment signed off, every contract. They're chasing off. sales, they're much more driven. Yeah. yeah, so they tend to be the fastest growing businesses, but it's more driven by a fear of Yeah, we never had any cash and we grew fast. We did, yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were thinking, shit, you know, if we, if we don't close some business, we could be out of business ourselves in two, three months. And we always have yeah. that. And we use every penny to invest in yeah, the growing, back into growth. to back into growth. And you know, not everyone does that, right? Some people want to have a lifestyle business and just stay and the same. I don't want to give away all the stuff you've written in the book. People should buy the download. Oh, there's tons more, don't uh, we? No, no, I know, I know this. <laughs> I just thought I'd seg- we'd segue into maybe culture and um, an org structure. I know they're not necessarily the same thing, but but it's sort of both are on the people side of the hmm. of the fence. And so what's your, the, you, you talk about pod structures yeah. in the book. Uh, and certainly that's something that I've used before. And I see now that people are describing that as an agile management and it's the, it's the coming thing. It's funny, I thought we invented it. But when, <laughs> but when you go out, you kind of realise that you, like, you talked about it from, from you know, the infrastructure world, so where you, the tech world where you came from. And, but I guess we discovered it. Like all, like all good businesses, all right. You, you kind of you try things, you make mistakes, you pivot, and you, you know, you try new things. And we kind of discovered we actually called them eco teams because they were self sufficient teams. And then we use the word pods because it, you know, I guess it's peas in the pod and it kind of makes sense. But actually, um, so I guess we we found it when we were at Blue Halo. Mm-hmm. We tried many different structures, hierarchy, and we just found that no one really. When it was hierarchies, no one really took, often people would drop balls and wouldn't, wouldn't take responsibilities. That was our personal experience. There was lack, less ownership. Yeah, that was the key thing. And we wanted to find a way that we could get, you know, people to take more ownership. So we'd experimented. And in agencies in particular, there's a big problem when they start. And there's a big historic problem because historically, you know, 100 years of agencies, I mean, it's pretty much from the end of the 18th century when agencies first started through to the beginning of the of, of the 21st century, you know, agency business hadn't really changed. It was an account director or client service director, an account director, an account manager, an account exec, and then a graduate at the bottom. And this kind of like hierarchy would basically look after client needs. But there were two skills they would provide, which is one is, you know, client services, communication and, and, and strategic planning. And the other one was project management. Now, when the tech world started becoming more pervasive with you know, digital site, the digital agency started to build, they were full of project managers. And we had account managers, we had project managers as well. And what we found was that most agencies have a role like it's called an AMPM. So what that means is that you've got one person doing two different jobs. One is, and ironically, they're, they're, they're just complete opposite ends of the spectrum. You need a highly detailed, often more introverted person to do the project management, internal looking, and someone much more expressive and extroverted often. And not, not, I'm not, yes, not, not in general. So in broadly, general, broadly yeah, speaking, yeah. who can look after the client and deal with you know the marketing managers who are like them. And so uh, what we realized was by decoupling that role from the traditional model and creating two separate roles and then and then creating a, a third role in the team into the pod, we could manage a client from end to end, we offer a client-centric approach in a much more sort of flat structure-based way. And the three people as a group could take ownership of any client from end to end and solve their problem. 
So I guess that's where we started with it. And then we... Well, it was about the ownership thing because as we were were growing, it was kind of... We kind of need to to spread the management of clients over over more people rather than coming up to the the top of a pyramid because that was stopping us growing. Yeah. And dragging you back into the business when, you know, we were trying to push you back out of the business to try and win your business. Yeah. And it, I guess we're a bit weird in our pod structure because our pods are just three people, whereas some people will group all of the creatives, the technical people and the management into one unit. Yeah. We don't really do that. We say, look, keep the talent pool, the talented people who do the, the billings, keep them you know, in this talent pool, keep the client-centric pods. If you imagine, uh, I guess, trying to explain this so people can listen to it, but um, if there were sort of three columns, we have the talent pool in one column, people delivering the work we have in the middle what we call the client pods so the am the pm and it's someone who's a subject matter expert is the third person in the pods so in a digital agency that could be like a business analyst or producer in a brand agency it might be a planner or it might be a strategist or brand strategist mm-hmm. and again depending on the agency and then in the third column you'd have the people working on the business strategy so you'd have the marketing talent hr and that's kind of roughly how it works but what we find is businesses we work with with flat structures because we use this tool called office vibe they all have extremely high employee net promoter scores okay. like they are significantly higher i mean i i haven't more actually got empowered, more engaged yeah i mean it's just it's evident to us the difference between those that's and by the way we kind of give the owners a choice do they want to build a hierarchy or do they want to they, you know there's a choice there because some people want to have five reports you have five reports you have five reports and, and it's a mindset thing isn't it if that's what you want to do it's yeah really, like it's it's really hard if they've never worked anywhere else I call it a leap of faith yeah. just because there's no sign. You know, you could try and prove it to people, but actually it's just an emotional decision, isn't it? Yeah. People are sort of, well, until they do it themselves, some people, they just they just need to be able to prove the model themselves. It's all very well going out into the marketplace and talking with peers, but some people just absolutely just need to get on with it and see it happening. Yeah. And we have a client, um, you know, who's got a flat structure and it's quite interesting. Someone, one of the account managers on her first day at work wrote this blog article saying, I've come to this business and I've just started and it's really great to be in a business where everyone's equal, you know, and yeah, there are people who know more than others, who have more accountability, more responsibility than others, but we're all, as a matter we've been here one year or 50 years, we're all, we're all one unit, we'll work together for the greater good of the company. And actually someone went on and I think I shared the post the blog article it was a beautiful blog I mean from to have it from someone just starting in a job as as a graduate and I saw about two competitors going oh that won't last you can't scale a business that way but as you know I, I went through, I read I listened to uh, Peter, Peter Drucker the famous management consultants uh, all, like, there's a summary of all of the talks he ever did mm. I'm going to quote this wrong now, but he told a story about how the British Empire, when it had looked after, um, when it was responsible for India, had run the whole of India on 1,000 people with no hierarchy. He was saying, you know, you can scale these things if you actually, you know, if, 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 if they are scalable, but most people... And he said that he had, when he was at Hewlett Packard, there was like 250 layers of management, I think it was, something like that, probably back in the 80s and 90s, which just sounds horrendous. I mean... Just take you back, the ENPS. Yeah. What's a great ENPS in your client base and what's a, an okay ENPS? So that you just said, you said flat hierarchies were oh. better... I can tell you now that the last couple of hierarchical ones were, I would say, between minus 10 and plus 10 uh-huh. uh, EMPS. And I'd pretty much say that all of the flat structure clients we've got are somewhere between 25 and 75. Yeah, well, that's fair. I was going to say 50 average. Yeah. yeah, definitely 50 to 60. In that 55, oh, we, we've got two at around 70 mark. At the yeah. Moment, so. And then, you know, the, okay, these are sort of maybe 30 to 50 size businesses. Yeah. Because um, that's where we can't specialise, but it's uh, no. It's just I was at, I was with the client the other day, and they were saying their EMPS was thirty, and uh, the feedback that they've been able to get from elsewhere that thirty was amazing, and so they well, felt that they felt that thirty is amazing. I mean, I, I mean, it is amazing. So they were they, they were like, this is not our problem. And yeah, I said, and, I, and I was just trying to push them and say thirty really. Is yeah, it, wouldn't it be great if it was seventy? Yeah, yeah. twenty. I, I, if they tell me it's fifty, I'm gonna be like, you can get higher than that. <laughs> 
the most important thing is, is they're benchmarking it because you're listening to people and you've got to benchmark so, you know a lot of people don't do EPS right so it's like if you do it then you can at least you've got a, a we were speaking earlier on I was saying that um, I've noticed that in December and January you know these scores tend to go down a bit because people get a bit miserable through the winter in the UK especially um, so there are always things that impact you know the results as well so um, what else what else about culture what else do you know about culture that people um, so we've talked about org structure measure MPS org structure impacts the MPS I think when when um, people are trusted to do a good job they'll yeah. go and do a good job yeah and when you remove power and authority you just take away all of the politics and all the problems the business just is more empowered and just yeah. someone said the other day it's like um, if you went out of your house every morning so you don't ring up someone and say, hey, just letting you know I'm getting on the bus now. Or, you know, you don't, you don't report into anyone. In, in your normal life, you do not have to report to people. You know, there's a set of rules, right? So, you know, you can't murder people. You know, you can't abuse people in whatever. You can't, you know, you can't break laws, of course. But, you know, you, you know, society, we don't need to report to anybody in life. We all grow, we go to work and all of a sudden we've got people we've got to report to we've got to justify what we're doing to it and actually it doesn't really make sense and we all know why you know um, there's a great book I always rant on about which is in fact one of your other podcast um, interviews mentioned it the guy who did the unlimited who did the unlimited holiday oh yeah yeah no um, the wages was it the way he was yeah, the yeah. choose your own select your own salary it's Frederick Lalu uh, reinventing organisations yeah. which I completely urge anyone to read because I think by the time you've read that book you know all the things you don't you talk about the Gallup survey and stuff it covers all of those things and he was saying you know uh it just tells great stories about how and it gives examples of very large companies where they've been totally they create this democratized workforce almost and all of a sudden it creates just much more just a much better working place Hen- henry stewart who i yeah interviewed stewart. a while ago when he's doing an sort of an event with clients he'll say just think about the best piece of work you ever did and then he says, okay, so now you've got that fixed in your mind. So was that because your boss managed you to do that? Or was that something you did on your own? Yeah. And nobody ever puts their hand up and says, you know, it was when I was being managed. No, no, it's to be yeah. managed. No, exactly. Like, you know, awful stuff. What else? Give me one more other thing, Pete. What's another thing? One that more you other know? thing. Um, for me, I'll tell you, one of the things I bang on a lot about with um, agents as they grow is commercial process. Yeah. You know, that I spoke about it earlier when we mentioned the cash flow and you know the lack of people having contracts or getting contracts signed or you know POs or that kind of thing. And it's just for me the one biggest complaint I have about working with agencies is just that no one, no collection of individuals seem to care about it. Like the FD might might care because he's not getting paid, but that always goes all the way back to new business did they get a contract signed off was the contract good was it explained to the client was expectation set all the way through to we're now delivering let's get sign offs at every stage let's get invoices out regularly let's get paid regularly that for me is my my biggest bugbear so if there's one thing I could leave everybody from you know listening to this today is to go away and kind of have a mini audit of your commercial process starting from when a lead comes in to give delivering a finished product, what are the legal, financial, commercial touch points all the way through? Are you, have you got a tight enough contract? Is there a good enough process? Is there communication between you know, new business and project management handing over? Do project managers talk to finance people regularly? All that kind of stuff. Uh, and, that's and, really the, and also, I, I just throw in the elapsed times, you know, because what's stopping you getting a quote out in an hour? Yeah. As a, why does it take five days? Well, let us speak you know, bluntly. It should be one of the most important things going on in any agency right now. You know, if you've got a, a hot lead, for me, it's well, let's get the quote out, let's get on the pitch, let's go and close some close some business. You know, it's not, not fanny around with something that isn't as important as that, to be honest. So, <coughs> okay, so um, I, at the end of uh, podcast, I always ask people two questions. The first one being, knowing what you know now, if you went back in time, is there anything you'd fix? 
So do you think that's fixed? Well, and, and not in the sense that you have any regret. I remember asking, to, having this conversation with Mike Tobin, and he said, no, it's not a regret thing. It's just a... You get to go back and go, oh, what that would about have been great. It would have been, what is the, yeah, what is the sort of the yeah, ha, What about yeah, lifestyle right. versus scalable? I guess when we started, we were like, we went into businesses and we were like, well, listen, we built Soul, so you should do that too. I, I think we assumed We've kind of everyone, matured in our thinking now, yeah? Yeah, we have. Everyone that appointed us wanted that as well. But I think yeah. Like the opinion has matured and I kind of touched on it. We spoke about it earlier. It's about getting people now to a place where they have a choice rather than, we're getting you to a place where you have to sell because not everybody wants to sell. Some people are, you know, built to last. Some people are built to sell. But at a certain size agency, you do have a choice in terms of what you want to do. And we know a few people who run agencies between the five and ten million pound turnover mark who have made that choice. Some of them are remained independent and they enjoy going in every day and being entrepreneurial and running their agencies. Some people have then gone on an acquisition strategy because that's kind of their next phase and they're really enjoying that. Uh, there's a guy on the south coast at the moment um, who was a two million turnover agency, you know, four or five years ago. And he's been on the acquisition trail now and he's now 13 million. He's absolutely loving it. Um, but, you know, he could have got to five million and sold. So for me, it's just about getting... Yeah, we're kind of, I guess you're is. reminding the lifestyle guys to say, squirrel away for, for their retirement rather than just using their drawings for their living and not kind of and then at the end bringing us up when they're 60 years old saying hey like I, I want to sell my business now having pretty much just drawn all the money out of the business for the yeah. past 20 Which years and realising that there's not a lot of value it's quite late now for us to help them yeah. so making sure if you go lifestyle prepare for it if you're going to scale prepare you know for the plan and I think we've probably changed off we're not yeah, as definitely. we're not as one trick pony no. let's say I you think know. to be fair when we first started doing this a lot of people called us because of what we'd done before yeah and it was kind of that well, you know you guys have been there and done it and can you help me kind of do it but doing it now is not necessarily getting me to a point where I can sell yeah it's yeah I've heard place where you know I, I want to get to to achieve my goals Whatever they may be. Yeah, I've heard. You know, I heard people say, "Oh, yeah, but you did that ages ago." Now so that's why I guess the you know, doing what we've done now for the last eight years has really superseded almost what we did at Blue Halo because we're much more current. We're more, you know with what we do now, we're working with much more modern probably businesses got. than probably we ever were. We've also got probably ten more case studies where we bought and sold agencies yeah. between you know now and when we exited out. See, what's also interesting as well is. If you were creative or, or an engineer, which a lot of agencies are owned by either creators or engineers, I mean, some were more entrepreneurs, um, those guys are often, I use the word often, less likely to scale organically on the whole. Like most creatives tend to grow a lot slower long periods of time because they care about the products. And same with the, the engineers, you know, they care about what they do. They do a, great, they do a better job than the sales driven, you know, entrepreneurial own, owners. Well, and I, well, I find that that type of people yeah. find it really, really difficult to hire sales people. Yeah. Because they only want to hire I have an ethical people well, it's, not, it's, not, it's not ethical, ethical it's but not it's ethical, like but you know yeah it's just they sit in a room and they go I'm not a salesperson I don't really so can you sell you can excellent you're hired and then they go oh, yeah. I've hired three sales people and they've none of them I'm, I'm, I'm going to abandon the sales process mm. because every time I hire a salesperson it doesn't work out for us and they go back they yeah. retrench back to their slow growth so on that no Pete I mean well I think um, I knew where you yeah. were going with this, <laughs> I think it was you know a probably I don't know it wasn't an epiphany at all but I think having done this two or three times now with you know smaller creative businesses acquisition has been the route forward for those guys yeah. in terms of finding you know similar sized businesses that those guys been, recently were like 18, I think it 18 years they've been going. Yeah, so I mean, a case I mean, study I would give yeah. this is a client we work with. He's probably, we've worked with him since sort of 550 turnover. He's up near 800 now. He found a local business um, that was turning over 800, 400 GP, maybe 150 net profit. And the guy was in his sort of 60s and just said, look, I'm looking for someone trusted to hand the business over to. I don't want to give it away, but um, we'll come up with something fair and reasonable in terms of a either a payment plan and agreeing the valuation etc um, and f coming up with a, a stage payment profile for that business actually meant that and I'll try and keep the numbers simple here but he, my client paid £14,000 in legal fees but added £1.2 million to the valuation of his agency on completion yeah 
So I thought that was a pretty and, good and almost doubled his almost doubled his turnover in one quarter. Yeah, yeah and, which and would have taken another another eighteen years probably. No, because, well maybe not eighteen years. That's probably a bit harsh. And because he cares about the product, he cares about the people, he cares about the process because that's his mindset. Yeah, yeah. can probably we, make we, that work better. Yeah, 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 yeah you're right. Helps. I mean, I was sitting there saying to the guy, I think there's gold in this guy's client base. So really, it's some great names in there. There's what I call sleeping giants, really, <laughs> accounts that haven't really been farmed over the years. It's just the the old agency only the phone would ring you pick up react take the order and deliver the work but actually a little bit of proactivity and I think uh, to get this right we had a whatsapp message from the guy the other day saying he had 300,000 yeah. of opportunities oh, is it? in the first six weeks since acquisition to just kind of shake the tree a little bit yeah yeah, because he's got the, our client. I mean, it's actually it's unusual. We don't normally work with clients that small, but we went in because we actually helped him buy out a shareholder. So actually, it's a bit of a, it was an interesting one for us, and we kind of yeah. liked him. Yeah, and we sort of stuck around because we kind of believe in him a little bit. But the fact that he separated the AM PM side out meant that his AM, his account management, so manager could be more proactive and yeah. do that. Yeah. Whereas before, because they're project managing as well, they can't. They just react, which is what the other guy had. They just reacting. All the time, well, that did both A and PM. You know, look, I, I, wherever I've been, I've split the similar role. Out. Yeah, you, you either end up with a PM who doesn't want to sell anything, or you end up with an A yeah. who just couldn't project manage to save their lives. It's really super yeah. rare. A person the, the problem is under half a million turnover yeah. for an GP of an agency. You don't well, really have a choice. Yeah, yeah but, but just it's... everyone listening, just to know that normally we find about six fifty k GP. They split that out, so it's but all these numbers are in the book, which is you know the book's full of numbers. So other than numbers. your book and uh, the book you've already recommended what one or three books do we reckon people should the reason I do what I do now is because I love business and I remember leaving I think it was maybe just before I started college and I did a business studies kind of uh, it was a GMBQ at the time, three A-levels worth of business studies. And I remember reading um, Richard Branson's book when it first came out about 24, 25 years ago. Uh, so I love reading entrepreneurial stories. So for me, uh, the Duncan Ballantyne autobiography is one I always go back to. There's some great entrepreneurial stories in there. It's actually quite a funny read as well. Uh, one thing sticks in the mind, you know, about credit control and, you know, only pay the screamers <laughs> was one of his phrases, uh, which stuck. And then the other one, actually, I read on holiday about two years ago. It's a recommendation from Spencer and Mark, who works with us as well. Uh, Maverick by Ricardo Semler. Oh, great yeah. book. And that is, it is a great book. I absolutely read that yeah. literally nonstop over like a two-day period, sat on the sun lounger. Mm-hmm. And it was a guy who ran um, a sort of conglomerate of businesses in South America in the 80s. Mm-hmm. But all the the modern day working practices we're talking about now yeah. you know the flat structures all that kind of stuff he had in like 1981 <laughs> it's yeah. amazing but it is absolutely you're a fan of that I love that yeah. book I yeah. love yeah. that book he, he, did, a fantastic, he did a fantastic interview with uh, Tim Ferriss yeah and Tim Ferriss is asking him about because one of the things he does is in the book he fires he fires all his old man it's because it was his father's business he fires the old guy yeah. and he's in Tim Ferriss is talking to him he said his dad went on holiday so he took the opportunity yeah. night of the long night yeah. well, his dad was away <laughs> to get rid of the ball because he knew if his dad came back and did, like, the timing yeah. he, he said he, he, uh, it was like seek forgiveness and ask permission yeah. Yeah. so right. he, did he, he said it would be quicker to do that than it would be to change them all because they yeah. were just also set in their ways which yeah. I mean, one of the things in that book that sticks in my mind is that somebody put in a requisition for filing cabinets. So he gets everyone in at the weekend and they get rid of all the paperwork that they no longer need. Yeah, they've got 50 have, empty ones. And they now have a surplus of five filing cabinets yeah. to sell. Yeah. It's just that, that, I don't know why that tickled me, but that's the type of... Well, there were lots of things in there that yeah. I find amusing. You know, those yeah, great things, book. So. Yeah. What about you, Spencer? That's a couple from Pete. God, I, I read so much. I've Reinvent the so many. Yeah, I, read, I mean, do you know, there's a few... I there's a couple probably. I mean, the first one I always talk about, which was referred to me by a good friend of mine, said, who I knew was a massive fan of, Jim, of um, Tony Robbins. I always found Tony Robbins difficult because I'm always a highly motivated person. Whenever I hear him talk, I feel like like he's positive like I am and I need someone different. But she said um, his mentor was a guy called Jim Rohn. And Jim Rohn, he says, is quoted everywhere because it's on the internet and you see all of his great sayings. But... He uh, wrote a book called The Art of Successful Living, which I've only got on a CD-ROM or CD, not a CD, an audio CD, which means I can't play it anymore because I've got no... But I remember listening to that and it really fixed... 
it validated my mindset a lot and I still go back to it now and try you know I put it in my PlayStation now to listen to it but I, I still find that um, Jim Rohn had just a really good philosophy around having the right mindset and it's funny when I read all Peter Drucker's books which I, I would recommend to read because they're really quite tough to, to get through at the end he kind of concludes it doesn't matter what you know about business management it, you know it's all it's all superseded by mindset he was the guy that said culture trumps uh, strategy yeah. and but you know he said it all, at the end of the day it all comes down to mindset if I'm right mindset. so I think that's probably one of the other things we've probably learned over the last eight years is you know mindset trumps everything I really like Nikki Gatsby's book, Super Engaged, yeah. which is kind of, I'm a bit jealous of and envious because it's the book I wish I could have written. But we kind of wrote a book that covered every aspect of agency life. But I just, I love what she's done. And yeah. I think she deserves a lot of credit for yeah, it. Yeah, no, she was a great guest. Was she on your yeah, show? Yeah, yeah. Oh, see, how did I not know I that? I spoke to her a few months ago, yeah. Oh, we have to send, tell her that I recommended <laughs> her book. <laughs> But uh, yeah, but I think it's, it's almost like that bit was set up. <laughs> no, I, I, I can't believe I missed it. I need to go back and uh, and listen to that interview. Right, guys, thank you very much indeed. That's right, thank you. you. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks very much for having us on. All this information and more can be found at dominicmonkhouse.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find show notes additional reading and links related to this episode. You can also find my blog and the past editions of the Melting Pot newsletter. The simplest thing to do is to sign up to my subjectively, not crap, once a week newsletter, where I'll update you on what I've been up to, the most interesting articles I've read, and all things relating to scaling up, high-performing teams, net promoter score, company culture, etc. Social, you can find me on Twitter, at Dom Monkhouse and LinkedIn at Dominic Monkhouse. LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach me and share your questions and comments. Thanks for listening.